today I have a very simple title to this message. It says, I must, you must. And that will become clear as we go along. I must, you must. Now there are a lot of responsibilities we have in life, things that we must do to take care of ourselves and those around us. And these responsibilities start at a very young age. You might remember the first time your mom told you to put the candy down and uh, eat your vegetables. Anybody remember that? <laughs> well, because you, you have to eat healthy if you want to live healthy. And I'm well aware that ice cream tastes a lot better than spinach, but you have to eat your spinach. And another day, your mom taught you that you need to brush your teeth every night before you go to bed. And some mothers are even so hardcore, they say you brush your teeth before you go to bed and as soon as you get up in the morning. Because if you don't brush your teeth, soon you'll have no teeth. And, and then when you turn four, you realize you must go to school. That was a very traumatic experience, I know, in my life. Uh, for the next number of years, uh, it, it was terrible. Many tears are shed at school bus stops and, and in parking lots as, as parents and children separate and these children begin their educational career. But going to school is something they must do. And if you are a healthy, strong, intelligent adult, there's something you must do. Get out of bed and go to work. Amen. <laughs> there's no option for going in a couple of days this week, then you skip next week, and the third week you, you uh, go on vacation. You've got to get up and go to work. And if you don't work, you'll starve. The Bible tells you if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. <laughs> So there are a lot of things we found out that we must do. And when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he was in the same situation that we are. The Bible tells us of a time when he was 12 years old. He went with his family up to the temple for the feast of Passover. And when all the festivities were over, uh, they headed back home and Jesus' parents just assumed he was somewhere in the crowd with the rest of their relatives. But after a day's walk, they realized he was nowhere to be found. So they went back to Jerusalem, and two days after that, they found him in the temple, uh, sitting there uh, talking with the uh, Torah teachers, having this, this big, intense conversation. So as you would expect, his mom said, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And then for the first time in scripture, we hear Jesus speak, and this is what he said. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? As far as Jesus was concerned, even at this young age, there was something far more important than heading back home with his family after the big feast. Uh, where did he sleep in those nights he was there alone? We don't know. Who fed him? How did he sustain himself? We don't know. But one thing we do know, he said, I must be about my father's business. And this wasn't the last time Jesus used the phrase, I must. In, in Luke chapter 4, now he was fully 30 years old and had been just baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And the power of the Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove, and he began traveling around Israel, telling people about the kingdom of God that he had come to establish. First, he went to his hometown of Nazareth, and then he went to Capernaum, and he was very, very well received in Capernaum, and the people tried to keep him there, to keep him from uh, going to minister anywhere else. But Jesus said, I must 
preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because for this purpose I have been sent. Another I must statement, another statement of purpose. I must preach the kingdom of God. But it didn't end there. On another occasion, Jesus went again to the temple in Jerusalem for another feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is in John chapter 7. And as you remember him uh, talking to the teachers back when he was 12, now he was the one doing the teaching as he had entered fully into his messianic uh, ministry. And, and so uh, he, things were going fine, but it all came to a crashing halt when he identified himself as the everlasting God when he made the statement before Abraham was, I am. And the righteous Jews picked up stones immediately to stone him to death for blasphemy. They said, he can't live. This is a man making himself God. Then, then Jesus did one of the coolest things you can ever imagine. Luke 8, 59 says, Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. This was his invisible man routine. Love to see that. Well, I guess I wouldn't if he was invisible. As soon as he escaped, he saw a blind beggar at the side of the road, and he stopped to heal him and restore his sight. And at that time, you would think he'd be moving as fast as he could away from the temple. But he put aside all thoughts of his own personal safety to minister to somebody in need. And you might wonder, why did he do that? And he gives us the explanation in John chapter 9 with another I must statement. John 9 and 4, he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So what's the lesson we're learning from all this? And it says, don't ever ignore the will of God or lay aside doing the work of God for any purpose of pleasure or, or convenience or even, as Jesus did in this case, personal safety. When we have a clear view of God's will for our lives, we, we have to go forward and fulfill it. And Jesus actions in the temple show us that and, and outside the temple with this blind man and so he said I must do my father's will uh, I, I think we can add a little phrase to that is we must go forward and full, fulfill his will no matter what and as we look further into Jesus's life we see that's really the way he lived he resolved to fulfill God's will in his life at all times, no matter what. And so we'll move on to the most important example of how this played out in the life of Jesus. And Mark chapter 8 tells us about uh, a little informal Q&A uh, question and answer session Jesus had with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. And he asked them, what are people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And Peter, who was the unofficial spokesman for the group, spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. You are the deliverer of Israel. He got the picture. This was a divine revelation to Peter. And he suddenly understood the power, the position, and the majesty that Jesus had. And, and here's what happened next. Mark 8, 31. Jesus, he, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. He spoke it plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful 
of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, Jesus didn't speak about his coronation as king of Israel or crowds bowing down at his feet or the armies of their oppressors being struck down just by the word of his mouth, although all of these things will come to pass. But as we celebrate at Easter every year, this glorification could only come after his suffering. I must go and suffer. I must be rejected. I must be killed. And I must rise again. And so you don't want to miss this part. After receiving this incredible revelation from God, and then after receiving this chilling prophecy from Jesus, Peter took it upon himself to straighten Jesus out. And, and so, to put my own words in Peter's mouth, he said, Jesus, in, in case you've forgotten so fast, I am the one who just got this big revelation from God, and I am telling you, you forget about all this pain and suffering stuff. It's not happening. Then Jesus turned the rebuke right back in Peter's face and said, get thee behind me, Peter. No, that's not what he said. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He, I mean, the fact is when God speaks, we need to know there's somebody else listening in to everything that God is saying. And, and he is there to deceive, to disturb, to disrupt, and to destroy everything God wants to do in your life. I hope we all know that. He is our worst enemy. He's called Satan, Lucifer, or simply the devil. He came full force against Jesus, just as he comes full force against us. And, and so, in this case, he put his words in Peter's mouth and, and said, no, Jesus, uh, this isn't happening. Uh, you're not going to suffer. You're not going to die. And, and now, sometimes we really face opposition to what God is trying to do in us. Of course, the main opposition is our own disobedience, our own fear, our own laziness, our own lack of faith. Somebody said amen. Somebody said ouch. That's the, we are often our own worst enemy. And, and sometimes it's the devil. And we have to be vigilant and to recognize the source of the opposition that's coming against us. And if it's Satan, we need to rebuke him uh, just as Jesus did every time he rears his lying, rebellious head. Settle it in our hearts. We are going to serve God whatever it costs. Now, now that's an easy statement to say. That's an easy statement to say. And, and when I say it, I am convicted myself because I have not always done everything that God told me to do because it was too hard. But I hope we can settle it in our hearts, Brother Anurag, like your grandmother was saying. When we say, I surrender all, as I told you his grandmother wouldn't let them sing that song. She said, you're lying. Because if you say, I surrender all, that means I surrender all. But let's pray that God will give us the grace and the strength to obey and to do what he tells us we need to do. Now, up to this point, we've heard Jesus say, I must be about my father's business. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. I must suffer and be rejected and killed. And I must rise again the third day. And, and so with all that in mind, we now come to the most crucial part of this, of what I want to share with you today. Jesus didn't just make a bunch of I must statements regarding himself. He also turned his attention to us 
and issued a you must statement that we need to discuss right now. Now, what did he say we must do? Ah, some of you already know the answer to the question. John 3, the second half of verse 7. You must be born again. You must be born again. Now, if you haven't read much of God's words in the past, this may sound a little strange to you, just as it did to the man Jesus said it to. Now, this man, Nicodemus, was a very religious man, a prominent teacher in Israel, a ruler of the Jewish people, sitting on the highest governing council uh, with all the chief priests and elders. Uh, he was very well aware of the activities going on in the desert as people flocked to John the Baptist and were baptized in response to his preaching. Many people were wondering <clears throat> if John was the reincarnation of one of the prominent Jewish prophets or whether he may actually be their long-awaited Messiah. But John made it clear, I am not the Messiah, but I am the forerunner of the Messiah. I have come, like Isaiah said, to prepare the way of the Lord. And then the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And this news got back to Jerusalem, and after Jesus was baptized by John and tempted by Satan in the desert, he came to Nazareth and Capernaum, as I mentioned, to begin his ministry, uh, preaching about the kingdom of God, doing incredible miracles. And Nicodemus was very intrigued by all of this, and he was anxious to meet Jesus if he could. And so here's what happened. Uh, he, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Marvel not that I said to you, repeat with me, you must be born again. Now Jesus didn't even bother to acknowledge the truth of what Nicodemus had been saying about him. He went right to the core of the message he had come to bring to the world. You must be born again. Now he said this to a very religious man, a teacher, and worshiper according to the law of Moses. The, the name Nicodemus was of Greek origin, which may indicate that he was a, a Gentile proselyte converted to Judaism, or maybe he came from a non-Israeli family. But by the time of this meeting, he was firmly entrenched in the religious and political leadership in, in Jerusalem. And now he was confused. Jesus, I'm an old man. Can an old man like me go back into his mother's womb and be born again? No doubt about it, Jesus had his full attention. And before I go on to explain what Jesus meant, 
let me try to get your full attention. You may be like Nicodemus. You've got it made. You strong religious observances, political power, the high status in society, great intellectual skills, financial security. Uh, and I mean, you may be here in the building with us today. You may be online. You just happen to be surfing the web and just uh, came across our live stream. So you're the one that I'm reaching out to today. Sometimes we think about all the people who are uh, hard done by and have nothing and, oh, I need Jesus. But everybody needs Jesus. If you're at the top of a hill or the lowest valley, we need Jesus. So beyond all the good things you've worked so hard to achieve and beyond the social status that you enjoy, you're very curious about this man called Jesus. How is it that he continues to be so relevant and respected and revered 2,000 years after his death? 2.2 billion people in the world identify themselves as Christians, according to World Data and, and the World Data website. And, and there are churches and worship centers uh, dedicated to Jesus all around the world. And now you read about him saying that there is a new birth you need to experience, a birth of water and of spirit. It's very interesting. Now, three or four years after Jesus and Nicodemus met, Peter, who we mentioned earlier, gave a similar speech to thousands of people in Jerusalem who had come to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And this was about seven weeks after Jesus had been crucified. And Peter was making it clear that everybody involved in killing Jesus and supporting his death had committed a heinous crime. He also informed them that Jesus hadn't stayed dead, but had been raised back to life after three days by the power of God. So you can imagine what these people were thinking. If Jesus has come back, we're in big trouble. Now he'll be coming after us. So in Acts 2 and 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And please take note, they didn't say, what shall we do to be saved? That was the Philippian jailer. These people, I believe, were just saying, what do we do now? We crucified Jesus, and he's come back, and we're in trouble. What shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Hmm. That simply means change your mind, turn from what you are doing, uh, you thought Jesus was just uh, a troublemaker, a rebel, someone who is going to mess up your political situation in Jerusalem. Repentance simply means a change of heart, a change of mind. Now you recognize Jesus not as a troublemaker coming to mess up your life, but as the Savior who will give you eternal life and deliver you from sin. So that's repentance. And, and so he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the payment or the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. This is the birth of water and spirit that Jesus was telling Nicodemus about. Now, to be totally honest with you, every sin we have ever committed is known and noted by God. And sin leads to eternal separation of us and banishment from the presence of God. Instead of everlasting life with Christ, where there's love, 
joy and peace abounding, there, there is an awful option of death in the kingdom of Satan where hate, hopelessness, violence, and loneliness abound. And this isn't just some theoretical statement. Even as we speak, the effects of these evils are on full display in our city. Even though Toronto is considered to be one of the best cities in the world to live. Mental illness is rampant. The loneliness and depression are present in every level of society. Uh, in 2019, uh, I, I was just looking at some StatsCan numbers. Of all the teenagers who died in 2019, 30% died by their own hand, died by suicide. That's shocking. And this in a country that is always ranked somewhere in the top 10 of best countries to live. And, and, and some people have even died by stabbing or by burning on our public transit system. So when I talk about this, this uh, uh, hate and violence and all this that, that comes from being a part of Satan's kingdom, we are just getting a little glimpse, a little window in our city of what that would look like. Can you imagine what life would be like without the presence and spirit of God in this place and Satan having full reign to do whatever he wants to do? So again, I'm not talking about some uh, fancy theory that, that has no basis in reality. We are seeing it in our own city, the impact and power that sin has in the lives of people. And so, as Jesus told Nicodemus, as Peter told the crowd in Jerusalem, I'm telling you the same thing today. You must be born again. You must be born again of water and of spirit so that God can recreate you in his image and likeness. That's the only way to enter into his eternal kingdom. If you ask the Lord to forgive the sins you've committed, he'll do it. That's why he was crucified. His death was to make full payment for all the sins you have ever committed or will ever commit. And so as we're coming to a close, what I'm about to suggest may seem like a very simple, even childlike activity to you. But I'd like to lead you in a prayer of repentance. Just as I used to lead my children in prayer when they were young. Now you can feel free to repeat the exact words that I say, or you can just wait till I get to the end of a sentence and say amen, which is a sign of acknowledgement and agreement. It means so be it. And so, uh, just to change your position, let's stand for a moment, please. And as I say, now, in, in Pentecostal services, we, we don't often uh, do something like this. But there's some of you here who don't know how to pray. And this is a sample. So again, you can repeat after me or just say amen. God, I thank you for the privilege of prayer. And I thank you that you hear me when I pray. I confess that I have sinned against you. I have disobeyed your word. I've disobeyed your law. I have even gone against the voice of my own conscience. So I am well aware that I have done wrong. I am well aware that I should receive your judgment on my sin. And your judgment is eternal separation from you. 
But since your word says I can come to you and ask for your forgiveness, I'm coming. I come in faith that you will forgive me. I come in faith that you will change me from the inside. Please forgive every sin that I am confessing to you now. And I ask you to forgive sins that I have even forgotten about. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your forgiveness. I'm asking you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. So that I'll have the strength to live the life you want me to live. And I ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Having prayed this prayer with me, this may be the first time you've ever attempted to pray, but your next step is to be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to receive your formal forgiveness and payment for your sins, to have them washed away. This symbolizes the end of your current way of life following your own rules and regulations following your own uh, way and and it means a start of a new life with Christ Jesus as your Lord your guide your master and so please be seated in the congregation you may be seated uh, now I would like you to stand if you would like to be baptized today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you just have a lot of questions in your mind swirling around, if you stand, we'll have someone come, uh, someone on our prayer support team, they'll come and join with you and pray with you, answer your questions now. And so I, God bless you. I see uh, one person so far. You just stay standing, please. I, I don't know if there's someone else I might be missing. Another uh, a lady at the, at the back, God bless you, God bless you. And now uh, quickly our directors, our ministers, our prayer team, just um, please, uh, if there's a lady in the balcony and another under, uh, just uh, at the, the back here in the center section, I'd like you, uh, and I, I don't know if, um, can't see well enough through the lights to know who it might be, but it's someone in, in our Hungarian group. And, and so, again, we'll need someone just to go and uh, help this lady. I have a chat with her, uh, find out if she's ready for baptism or we need some questions answered. And then certainly you can prepare these folks to be baptized today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said, if you do this, God is going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we, we need one of our, our ladies up in the, in the top. I, I don't see anyone yet who has come up to, the, um, uh, to this lady up top. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, I must. And then he said, you must. And today we see some who are taking the step to say, yes, I will. Amen. So let's all stand again in the name of our Lord Jesus. We're going to pray. I'm inviting anyone to come uh, forward to pray who, who would like to really uh, just take some time in the presence of God to just flush all of the evil and sin out of your system out of your heart in confession, in acknowledgement uh, of the power of God at work in you 
right now. I'm inviting anybody who would like to come, to come. If you would like special prayer for some need in your life, uh, you come. Brother Chris will be here. Uh, he will be, uh, I actually, I don't see him, just right this second. Um, where is he? Uh, yes, uh, if you, you come, uh, whoever is uh, going to be doing baptisms today, if you can just get ready. We want to baptize uh, these dear ladies in the name of the Lord. And we just want to thank God for what he is doing in the hearts of people today. Anybody happy? <laughs> Let me tell you, the scripture says there is joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. And so there's double joy in heaven today because there are two. And to say nothing of so many others around this world who may be in this exact situation now. And we just want to pray that God will do a mighty work in each heart. I know our broadcast has ended just now, uh, but uh, and, and for those who, uh, or at least my, my screen is gone, if we're still online, certainly if you were watching online and God did something in your heart and you want to take the step to completely repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in his name, receive his spirit, we will gladly, if you're not in the Toronto area, we will gladly put you in touch with someone near you who will be able to help you in this regard. And so God be with you. We're just going to pray. Uh, and and I, I, I will ask Sister Cheyenne just to come and lead us in worship for a few more moments. But you come if you need special prayer, if you just like to come and spend some time talking to God, please do so at this time in Jesus' name.